Hello, everyone. I'm Susan Nash, AAPG. I'm absolutely delighted to be here today. And we have a really unusual and very um, important session today. It's, it's being sponsored by the Energy Minerals Division. And basically from a lot of kind of existential questions that, that have been going along around in, in our, our profession. And as things are changing, uh, energy transition, et cetera, seemed like a really good idea to be able to have something that talks about well-being and uh, well-being as a member and in your personal life, your career, um, in, in profession. So I'd like to introduce Mike Bingle Davis, who is the president of APG en Energy Minerals Division. Maureen Mahoney, National Speakers Association, has run Calm in the Storm programs. And Lorraine Kwai, retired FBI uh, special agent, incredibly fascinating background, who, and one of her books is Secrets of a Strong Mind. So welcome. So I'll turn it over to you. I'll stop sharing. I'll turn it over to you, um, Mike. Thank you. Uh, as Susan mentioned, I'm Mike Bingle Davis. I'm president of the Energy Minerals Division. I'm a geologist for Kirkwood Oil and Gas. It's a small family owned company that's three generations in uh, working out of Wyoming and operating in like five, six different states and other countries around the world. Prior to that, I worked in the uranium industry, uranium mining um, with Cameco, an international company. And prior to that, I also did environmental geology for approximately four and a half years. So I did have a pretty extensive background in a variety of different geological aspects. And Susan approached me to talk today or to kind of present to the individuals that are on the panel on the topics of, you know, the uncertainty in the industry and how to cope. Um, I know from a personal level that dealing with that uncertainty is difficult and um, it's, it's, it's hard to know what you're doing and, and what to do next when there's so many things going on around you. So with that, I'll hand it over uh, in order, I guess, uh, to Lorraine and on down the list that I've got at least in front of me to introduce themselves. Thank you, Mike. My name is Lorraine Kwai. And um, I think probably the first thing to know about me was I was born and raised on a cattle ranch in Wyoming. So uh, we, I like to joke that uh, fast food for us was hitting a deer at about 60 miles an hour. But I went from the, uh, from the cattle ranch uh, uh, and then was hired as a uh, FBI agent. And I spent about 24 years, almost 25 actually, as a special agent working uh, counterintelligence and espionage, primarily in the San Francisco area. It's an area that's um, full of spies, foreign spies out to steal information, classified information. So that was my basic career. I retired and when um, I've always wanted to write, so I wrote a book and it's called Secrets of a Strong Mind and then went on to develop online pro training program by the same name, Secrets of a Strong Mind. So it's taken me about 10 years of research um, and uh, study in order to really put this program together, Secrets of a Strong Mind online. Because I use one thing I learned in the FBI. Well, well, you know, you'll hear me say this again. But while theories are nice, evidence is better. So uh, all of my work is backed up in either neuroscience or psychology. So I'm looking forward to meeting everybody in this room. Hello, my name is Maureen Mahoney. I am the director of online learning for the National Speakers Association, and. Um, I, we uh, ran our, uh, the Calm in the Storm program, uh, which, uh, which we'll talk about today, but uh, we, we uh, let our members have access to this because I think um, when we talk about the uncertainty of everything, uh, man, everybody experienced, uh, ter has, been, has been experiencing a lot of change in a very short a period of time. And from, a, from the speaking industry, um, 2020, uh, COVID hit and live events shut down. So people had to pivot. They had to make like 
fundamental changes to their business. Um, and some made it and some did it. And, um, and so now that we're kind of coming out of this, we're not really coming out of it, but we're really building this framework for this new world that we're living in. So how do we move forward with the tools that we knew and with all of these new things coming at us all at once, how do we manage this? And so, um, you know, I'm happy to talk about, you know, some of the um, uh, successes and, you know, some of the failures that we had. And I don't like to say failure, but it failure, you, you, you get information that way. And so I, so I, I, I'm seeing a lot of similarities. Uh, you all are in a much more, much more smarter <laughs> uh, uh, um, industry. Uh, there's a lot of things going on, but um, I'm hoping to bring some context to kind of some of the things that we did and how we can translate a lot of this stress into some successes. So thanks so much for having me today. Great. So Mike, you have some questions. I think they're really helpful and, and I've got them here in, in case you don't have them, but just some some kind of um, questions that, that get to the heart of the changes. Right. Uh, and I'm going to go off script a little bit here and not, not too much. I mean, if you've looked them over, then nothing will take you by surprise. But uh, one of the main issues I think that I'm going to use geologists in a general sense. Um, I'm assuming that most of the people that are in attendance are either members of AAPG or have heard about this on LinkedIn or have experienced this in some form. But one of the things that I find personally kind of the most problematic right now, now you did mention COVID. That was a huge disruptive event. And, you know, I might touch on that if, if, if I have time. But first and foremost, you know, I find it a little bit disheartening and a little bit confusing as a geologist and involved with the extractive industries to simultaneously be asked to aid and support a world simultaneously uh, being told that what we are doing to support this world is being phased out. So it's kind of like carrying the burden of supplying an individual with the means they need to survive, while also being told that told that there there are things in the works that are going to eventually replace you, and at that time we will no longer need you, and we will you will be pushed to the wayside. If any of you want to, if you know if that's something you want to address. Um, um, sure. You want me to go ahead and start, Mike, uh, what my thoughts are? Yeah. If, um, because what I thought as I listened to you and I was reading some of the things that you wrote, I, you know, I think we all need mental toughness these days. And as Maureen alluded to, you know, with COVID and everything else, it's not just the geologist industry. Everything is, 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 is in turmoil and changing. So, but I think it is particularly true for geologists for the reasons you just stated, Mike, uh, because the, you, these are the folks who are truly at the forefront of changes happening in an incredibly important industry. Um, and I guess I'd just like to take a moment to just define, I mean, I think a lot of people think that mental toughness is bulldozing our way through obstacles. And, you know, that might work in snowdrifts and in football, but not necessarily in business and life. And most of the examples of mental toughness are, are in sports, you know, where people are coached how to attack the problem. But this approach is incredibly exhausting, and it can lead to, you know, burnout, depression, anxiety, when things don't go as we feel they should. And um, in this situation, the boom and bust that you were talking about that geologists have to depend on is, is largely dependent upon government regulation and policies, things over which you have absolutely no control. So I think geologists do need a strong mind to be at the forefront of the change of, of mindset that is moving quickly through your end industry. So I, I'd like to begin by defining a strong mind. I think that's important. Um, it's managing your thoughts and your emotions and your behavior in ways that will set you up for success. It's all about your mindset. 
And your mindset is something you can control no matter the situation. Um, and I'll give a, an, an example of, of how that happened to me. I was assigned to be a backup for the FBI SWAT team for an arrest. And the SWAT guys would make the initial entry into the house. So I was told to go to the back in case one of the suspects made a run for it. Now, the, the suspects were, were known terrorists, and they were also known to be armed and dangerous. And so the more I began to think about the chance that one of them might escape through the back door, the more it seemed like a very real possibility. And that made me increasingly ner you know, anxious and nervous. You know, would I really shoot a fleeing felon? Better yet, what if I missed and he got away? Or worse, what if he started to shoot back? You know, my hand at that point was shaking so bad, I, I couldn't have hit the side of a barn. But I knew I had to perform because lives were at stake. And I tried, you know, the soothing self-talk to calm my nerves, but that just seemed to upset my thinking brain even more because this was just not the time for empty promises and platitudes that would just make me feel better. The anxiety was high and I needed an equally strong emotion to counter the pressure. I needed to make a mental shift in my thinking. And let me just share my screen for a moment and bring this up. The thing is, and th this is the whole thing about mental toughness. And I don't know, I think maybe the, your, the photos are going to cut off part of this, but the first thing to do is change the mindset. We change the mindset, you change the behavior, you can change the outcome. So change mindset, change behavior, change outcome. I mean, that's the, that's the, the crux of it. So instead of experiencing anxiety, I just chose to look at my situation as both challenging and an opportunity. We'd be looking, we'd be getting known terrorists off the street. And that was enough for my hand to stop shaking. The suspects surrendered with no gunshots and no one making a run out the back door, which was my goal, right? Um, so I would just say reframing your response to the pressure you are experiencing now is extremely effective. And sure, you can take a few deep breaths, in, you know, like we all read about, take, you know, take a few deep breaths and that's fine, but that's really not the purpose. That's not really going to help you that much because what that, those few seconds will do will give your, your slower thinking brain time to catch up with your emotional uh, the, and faster emotional brain. So the key is to control the emotional drama queen brain so your emotions don't sabotage your performance. And again, I, you know, theories are nice, but evidence is better. So um, my work is based in psychology and neuroscientists, and psychologists believe it's too great of a leap for calm and anxiety to exist peacefully in our emotional brain. So instead, they argue that anxiety and excitement are much closer emotions. So it's an easier mental shift to reframe your anxiety as excitement or as an opportunity, which is what, which is what I did. The strong mind controls their mindset. And so this creates an upward emotional spiral, which will help you keep from feeling burned out. And um, the other thing I would say is, you, if you go to my website, I have a free mental toughness assessment that's been validated by the um, clinical psychology department at Arizona State University. I mean, there's no obligation, uh, but it's a great tool to help you pinpoint those areas in which you're strong and those where you could um, use a little help. Does anybody have any questions? I'm trying to stop the share. There we go. Well, I'll just jump in before um, Maureen had, uh, um, speaks. I just wanted to mention that I, I really think that what you're saying ties in really well to like thinking fast, thinking slow and mm -hmm. Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky and, and the whole idea of how to disable your reptilian brain. <laughs> you got it because that emotional drama queen brain just takes over and it's, it's innate. It's not you or me. It's innate. So yeah, it's so true, Susan. Well, thanks. Thank you. You know, I'd like to piggyback on what Lorraine is saying here. I mean, she's uh, you know talking about reframing your mindset and really taking that negative thinking out. And 
you know, putting a positive spin to it. I think, and it, it really takes practice, I would say. So we all think, okay, when I'm in this situation, I'm going to do this. Well, you have to make, you have to make a habit, right? First, so you can do these uh, mindset changes without even thinking. And sometimes I need somebody to, you know, call me out and say, okay, you need to uh, make that into a positive statement, or I have to, you know, uh, stop myself really. Uh, but, you know, I noticed in the chat, um, Tom was saying, you know, you have control what you can control. And I think that is also a key because you can, you can only control the things in your world that you can control. So if you're in a situation where it's high pressure or, you know, in a, in a life or death kind of situation, it's, you know, assessing where you're at and what can you control and how can you make the best decision that you can out of, you know, a really high pressure situation. So, you know, some of my tips that I, that, you know, I would say, uh, really is to really start small. If, I mean, I don't know if it, if I'd love to hear in the chat, if anybody has any, um, does any kind of meditation or like a body scan, uh, once and once a night, I know those are some things that I've started with that can help me throughout the day. And that is really, you know, taking a moment, um, you know, right before bed, what I do and, um, you, you kind of say, okay, am I, you know, are my shoulders stressed out and is my, am I clenching my jaw? I have that problem all the time. I have to keep reminding myself to kind of, um, you know, clear my mind before bed because, I can't do anything in that situation. I'm going to, you know, if I have a big presentation in the morning um, and it's midnight and I can't stop thinking about it, I have to retrain my thinking and I need some sleep because I can't perform if I don't take a moment, slow down. And I think it really starts within yourself. And then you can, you know, build upon that uh, frame by frame with little things that you can add into your everyday habits. So um, I, I, I really think that uh, it's, it's just, a, a, it's, it's a process, right? So uh, you've got to start small before you can get to those big situations. And then when you're in a situation uh, and I'll say, uh, I, I, uh, one of my stories is I uh, ran the 2013 Boston Marathon. And if you remember what happened there, uh, we had a terrorist attack. Uh, thankfully, I was not anywhere near the bombing, but I was about two miles away. And at that time, I didn't know what was going on, but I'm having people texting me and calling me at, at, at the time. Um, I knew that there was something going on uh, from just hearsay. But when I finally figured out that there was a bomb situation that um, ahead, um, I, I was alone. I didn't know. I and and I'm getting all these phone calls. I'm a little overwhelmed. I can't call anybody because they 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 jammed all the phones. So in that moment, I'm thinking I need to get information out to my family that I'm okay. And I, you know, so you have to take a moment and. I, you know, the first thing I thought of was I need to get on Facebook. And I simply, I just remember, I simply wrote, I'm fine. And after, once I did that, that was a great lift off of my shoulders because now I've let my network know that I'm okay. So now I can focus on, you know, getting myself to safety and understanding the situation a little bit better. And how do I make this crazy opportunity into a really motiv motivational for myself because it's really easy to, uh, you know, get stuck in the situation, especially when people around you are freaking out. And how do you stay calm and kind of be that role model to um, help people make good decisions? Thank you. Um, I guess I'd I'd just like to add from my own personal experience uh, in dealing with this, that um, what I try to do is at least stay enrolled in one class per semester and slowly build options, right? So, it, you know, we're, we're naturally busy just by our own nature. We're all here at this, uh, on this webinar. So we're 
probably pretty proactive people. But if you can, try and take another class, try and expand a little bit of your knowledge. Um, yeah, and like Tom uh, Monder mentions, you know, how do you keep your head when those around you are losing theirs? Uh, you know, take a class, read some, read some, try to build on what your existing knowledge is. It kind of leads into my second, the second point or question that I've got. And that's that, uh, you know, when we look at the world, you know, I just, the question that I had previously that you answered or kind of discussed was that, you know, we're as geologists and extractive resources individuals, we're asked to produce with the knowledge that we're going to produce until we're no longer needed. Um, and, and that leads me to my second question, and that's that traditional traditional carbon-based sources uh, for energy generation are tried and true, right? They're basically used globally. And anybody that plays SimCity or something like that, a video game, very simplistic model, knows that the first thing we burn is wood, the second thing we burn is coal, the third thing we burn is petrochemicals, the fourth thing is nuclear, and then we go on from there. Um, that being the case, uh, we are now told that you know our petrochemical method of generating electricity is outdated uh, and is essentially the cause or the problem that the world needs to address immediately. So it's sort of like, you know, it's 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 unprecedented to have an industry that on one hand is supportive and and creating all of this stuff and on the other hand vilified right and looked at as the not only the savior of the entire world keeping the seven billion people alive but at the same time killing the seven pe billion people uh by the results of burning and using the fossil fuels that we're currently using so you know it's that dichotomy and that you know, you're you're the bad guy because you're killing all of these or causing all of these problems, asthma, whatever. But at the same time, you know that you're the reason why the world can support that. It's you you got a internal battle there that's tough uh, to reconcile. Um, and you know, we're told time and time again, you know, it would be nice to be able to. Um, say, okay, well, you know, let's have it, let's have it your way. What we'll do is we'll immediately stop and cease all carbon-based forms of electrical generation and get away from that. Let's save everybody. Let's stop. But knowing that we are not allowed to do that, because if we were to do that, it would result in widespread, large-scale casualties. So there's kind of that, you know, what's going on? What are we doing type question uh, that I guess I find myself asking. And I'm sure that everybody listening is also asked or anybody that's involved in, in uh, the extractive resources. And I don't know if it's a, if it's necessarily um, lack of understanding from a societal viewpoint that the only reason why they are able to plug in to the wall and do what we're doing now is all based on this thing that's being vilified. I, I, I'll leave it at that because uh, it obviously affects me. So I could keep talking about it for a while, but I'll I'll throw it to Lorraine. We'll go back to Maureen and we'll see what you guys have to say. Thank you. Oh, I, I I feel your pain, Mike. I feel your pain. Um, you know, geologists are are being placed in a position where they feel they need to defend themselves. The critics are out there and, you know, all too often, as we already know, they don't know what they're talking about. You know, as a spokesperson for the FBI in Northern California for four years, I got really tired of defending the FBI from attacks by the ACLU and others who felt that the FBI was unfairly targeting certain groups of people. Those, criticals, uh, those critics didn't know what they were talking about, pure and simple. But that didn't stop them from throwing mud, right? I was actually 
asked to be the guest speaker at an LACLU luncheon. And basically, I was their entertainment uh, as they took pot shots at the FBI. Uh, and in that situation, and where you, the geologists and you, Mike, are at right now, you have to remain positive and not get defensive. Um, but positive thinking has, I wonder, it's a miss, it's gotten bogged down in a lot of really empty platitudes and, and what I feel is an unhealthy search to be, to be happy all the time. Uh, but the science of positive thinking is not all about being happy or shoving negative emotions to the back of our mind. I'm, again, I'm going to sh share a story. Uh, one of the physical fitness tests at the FBI Academy was to jump off a 25-foot diving board into a pool uh, of water and with an M16 and then swim to the other side of the pool with a weapon. And I had two problems. I couldn't swim and I was afraid of heights. And I just knew that if I jumped off that diving board, I would drown. I would die. But if I didn't make the jump, my dream of becoming an FBI agent would be the thing to die. So, I mean, I was scared and I was filled with fear. Um, my reaction was common because negative emotions are much stronger than positive ones. And the reason is that our mind clings to negative information because it warns us of danger and it kept us safe from saber toothed tigers back in the caveman days. And this is the thing, negative information is like Velcro. It really sticks. Positive information is like Teflon. It's nice, but it easily slides away. So this is why we really need to hunt the good stuff. I'm going to just share my screen here uh, and hopefully I can get to that. And it will work, hopefully. Ah, voila. Um, but we need to hunt the good stuff uh, because our brain won't seek it out in the same way it seeks out negative information. Because negative information, remember, keeps us safe. And that's what our brain, that's, our, that, that's the jo brain's job is to keep us safe. And in fact, every culture has more negative words than positive ones. And again, researchers have found that 50% of our vocabulary expresses negative emotions. Only 30% express positive ones and 20% are actually just neutral. So that is why we have to hunt the good stuff. It's normal for you to focus on the bad or the negative in your job or situation, especially when you're under pressure. But again, you go back to science. Neuroscience tells us that the brain needs three to five positive thoughts to counter each one negative thought. So here I am up on this diving board, and it wasn't easy. But I came up with five positive thoughts while I was up there. First thing was no one had died in this exercise. I mean, I, that would have made the, 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 I would have heard about that. The coach was an excellent swimmer and he could save me. I knew the FBI wouldn't want the lawsuit my parents would launch against it if I did drown. I put on a life vest and perhaps most importantly, I felt the FBI was my path forward to a life of value and meaning. So I took a step and I dived into the pool. I still had the weapon, which was a requirement, and crawled basically on the bottom to the other side of the pool. It wasn't pretty, but I did get there. And I just want to share with you a couple of things here, too, of actions you can take now. Um, you know, jot down the verbal language you use to describe what you're feeling. Take a look at the number of negative words you use. For every negative word or thought, find between three and five positive words or thoughts to counter it. And the second thing is, if you are leading a team or if you have colleagues, sit down and find ways to help your team or your colleagues hunt the good stuff on an average day with no urgent deadlines. Again, Maureen was mentioning this. This helps them and yourself get into the habit of hunting the good stuff so it's easier when they're under pressure and they really do need to modify the way they're thinking about things that are going on. Thank you. Man, you know, we, Lori, I mean, we are in just such a time of everybody has an opinion, right? And so, you know, I want to encourage that you are the expert here and you, you've gone through a lot of schooling. You 
really understand, you know what you know. And the, the all of us who has an opinion on what you're doing and uh, these, none of these people probably even went to school for this. Uh, so, you know, I, if, if we were kind of dealing with the same situation from um, at, at the NSA, the National Speakers Association, but uh, where somebody, somebody can, with lots of confidence, tell you something that is just not true. And I think, um, you know, from a geologist perspective, you know, uh, uh, maybe translating that into some, into a fun learning opportunity to your network on, you know, why it has to be this way and the science around that, because people respond to the facts and the science of, you know, what is actually going on and why, uh, why, why it needs to be done in this way. Um, like Lorray said, it is so easy to get bogged down by all just all of the 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 bad apples, right? They can ruin ruin the bunch because uh, if somebody can give you a piece of um, you know non-constructive criticism that, will stick with you forever when that person didn't even ha have business giving you that information anyways. So I think what, you know, in our, in the common store program, there's a session called it feels personal, but it's not, uh, you know, you don't know what, uh, where the, where, uh, the public is coming from, uh, you know, what, if, if somebody from a, a negative perspective is coming at you and telling you what you need to do better and why they think it should be done in a certain way, you know, you kind of have to take a step back. Um, you know, the first couple of times that had happened to me where, um, you know, I, people were just giving me all kinds of opinions about what I should be doing better or, um, but you have to come back and say, I'm the expert and, um, you know, leverage that expertise. And, but with the same, you know, on the same token, you know, it's, it's weeding out that negative talk and, you know, maybe something's going on with that person on that one day, or maybe you can provide some value in um, explaining, you know, simple terms or just, you know, having it, having fun with it. That's what I found. Um, uh, you know, it just builds that thicker skin, I think. And again, you can only control what you can control. So you cannot control all the naysayers. It's going to happen. They're going to be a part of your life through, you know, forever. So, um, so it's how do you handle that? And how do you take the, all the, the negativity and, um, uh, really come up with a process that will kind of help you stay above the negative comments and then keep moving forward because that can just hold you down. So it's like, what can I learn from this situation? And then how can I move forward from it? And then when you're in the, you know, when you, uh, you come across somebody else that is going to give you some negative information, now you have, um, you've already gone through that process once, it's just going to get a little easier when you have to have some of these conversations because sometimes sometimes they're hard conversations and sometimes the first time you have it, you're going to sound a little uh, uh, not as eloquent as you thought, but you just keep practicing and you keep going and that, and, you know, that way you'll be able to um, be more confident in um, what you're talking about, because again, you're the expert and, uh, I don't know what I don't know. So, uh, I, I, I think the, those are some ways that you can, uh, move forward. So. Thank you. Does anyone have, uh, questions, any of the attendees or comments? If you do, just uh, raise your hand and it'll bring you to the top. There's Alan. If you want to unmute Alan, you go ahead and ask a question. Sure. I'll, <clears throat> I'll unmute and I'll even scare everyone by turning my camera on. Hi, Alan. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, great discussion. You know, very interesting. Um, yeah, Mike, I mean, you may have seen some of my comments in the chat. I mean, people are saying lots of bad things about us. 
Um, it's not necessarily practical or factually based. I mean, we're not going to stop using natural gas for sure, probably for decades to come. We'll probably keep using oil for decades to come, you know, at least 20 years or something like that. So now, meanwhile, if we're the subject of scorn, that's another story. Um, but I think the realization is going to hit more and more. We're kind of seeing that in Ukraine right now. You know, Germany was one of the greenest countries, you know, uh, and now they have to burn really bad coal, lignite and other things because they didn't plan ahead. They shut down all their nuclear, I think, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, bit by bit, facts will prevail again. So this is just kind of a phase we're going to. Now, interestingly enough, I went to a um, Houston Geological Society talk on Monday night. It was about the capital providers, the state of private equity. And this topic kind of came up and, you know, had to do with, well, the millennials, you know, I blame the millennials. The millennials are driving this and what's going on. And one of the speakers says, well, you know, first thing, the millennials are old now. They're 35, they're 40. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's one thing. And the second thing is they were relating stories where, yeah, they were being told like, hey, you must, um, you know, universities, pension funds must put 2% in ESG et cetera, et cetera. We've kind of gone through that phase. Now, guess what? Everybody actually wants to make money. At that time, you didn't actually have to have a positive return to invest um, in those things. Like break even, if you could make a story about break even ESG, that was okay. Well, now everybody actually wants to make money. So I think, again, we talk about toughness. I mean, we have to understand oil and gas aren't going away anytime soon. Yeah, it's a bit unpleasant, you know, watching stuff on the news every night, et cetera. But, you know, the facts will prevail over time. And sorry, I don't mean to hog, but I'll throw in a few topics for discussion. Now, if only the companies, they used to call them oil companies, but they call themselves other things now, right, and disown their heritage. If only they would hire, you know, I work a lot with students and they're not being hired by these very rich companies making lots of money. That's an issue. You know, if they would at least do their part, that would be good. So anyway, I just wanted to throw a few topics for discussion. Hope I didn't ramble on too much. But uh, yeah, it's a tough world out here in the ENP and energy business. By the way, I'm also crossing over. If uh, if the government wants to pay me a lot of money to put X's on the map, not to find oil, but to find aquifers that we used to fire those people because they weren't oil finders. Well, now you're getting rewarded because that's where you can stick CO2 in the ground. So I'm transitioning. That's the other thing. You just adapt all the time. I've done it for 30 years. Many of you have done it. And that's what you have to keep doing. So anyway, sorry, didn't mean to lecture too long. I think that's a really good point, Alan. I mean, I think um, I think you should always keep reinventing yourself, right? I mean, I think you should always be um, what's, what, what are people talking about right now? What are, you know, even if it's a, if it's something totally weird, like, learn about it because that way you have information and you can make better decisions about, you know, what, what things are. But I mean, even, you know, I, before, you know, from even from like job hunting, it's like people are asking for, uh, you have to learn this technology and you need to know this technology. And even I found myself super overwhelmed with all the things that are coming out now. I mean, I think even from like a technology perspective, it's like, you know, it's like buying a car. It's going to lose its value 30, you know, 30% when you drive it off of a lot, because there's already some technology that's even coming out even beforehand. So you have to just be aware of what's going out in your world and maybe even get outside of that a little bit. And what are some other industries doing that you can apply some concepts to? And I think that's what's super helpful about getting some different industry perspectives is um, what's ever, what are what's somebody totally different from what we're doing? How are they working and how can we apply these concepts to what we're doing now, because it might be something that you never thought of. You're on mute, Lorraine. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, you know, uh, what you're talking about, Alan, um, really speaks to how we all love co our comfort zones. Um, we find a place that we fit in and, um, I don't know. I guess we just think we're going to die there or something. I don't know. I always say the only 
difference between a rut and a coffin are the dimensions. So when we stick with one way of thinking, uh, it doesn't do us any good. And so that may have been the way it was two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, it may not be the way it is in the future. And so it's, it's really, I think, important for everybody and no matter where they are in their career it is to it is to move into discomfort zones. It'll prepare people more for when something like this comes up, Alan, when it, you know, you're being unfairly criticized. I, I kind of personally know what that feels like. I mean, you know, but you can't cry like a baby and, and hide. So, um, so I, I always encourage people to have a little Petri dish and in it is a, a whole bunch of activities that will put you squarely in your discomfort zone. Uh, for me, it's singing. I mean, I was asked to leave my choir. I mean, you know, in, in high school, it was bad. In a way, but the point being is that we can move into, we know what it feels like to be in a discomfort zone because a lot of us stay where it is comfortable because we don't know, we're afraid. Uh, and you'll notice a lot of my examples bring up fear as an emotion that just bubbles to the top when we're, when we're threatened or when things are different than we antici originally anticipated them to be. So- that would be my my two cents worth. And that was great, great points you made, Alan. Great points. Well, the cynical part of me says, okay, it's great to to diversify, but I've I've been in the CCUS round. This is like the second round. It's like um about 10 years ago, a little bit longer than ago. You know, we got um, a huge grant from the government to, to promote CCUS. <laughs> and so once those subsidies went away, we couldn't even pay people to come to the workshops. And and I, I think what happens is we might, I think it's good to keep um, grounded and focused on what you do know and keep it and, and keep up to that in that. And then yet diversify, knowing that it could turn on a dime and pivot back, especially as the energy needs start to, to increase. I guess, Susan, I'll, I'll join the conversation. If I'm cutting anybody off, let me know. But, you know, you're spurring lots of thoughts. So, you know, the, and by the way, don't forget the geophysicists here. I'm a member of AAPG and SEG, Society of Exploration <laughs> Geophysicists, you know, uh, we're geoscientists too. Um, but you know, the great thing about our training is that we can do any of those things. Someone just wrote them in the chat. You know, so honestly, whether you're doing CCUS, whether you're doing geothermal, whether you're looking for helium, it is still the same core skills. And so that's the beauty of it. So, you know, whatever. Right now, the government's throwing money, Q45 tax credits. Anybody has anything to do with CCUS, you're going to be able to you know, have some opportunities. I'm not guaranteeing lifetime employment, but, um, and again, geothermal, hey, you're going to need a seismic line. You're going to need to see where your well goes. You're going to need to calculate the temperature at the bottom hole location, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we have skills that are highly applicable to lots of places. And then we have to be chameleons, actually. We have to adapt. When they're throwing money to anybody that has anything to do, Q45 tax credits, I'm in the CCUS business. I just changed my website, by the way. To add that. And next year, if it's geothermal, I'll change my website again, right? You know, so that's a part of it. I'll mention just a couple of things. By the way, I'm an entrepreneur. I, I survived like four years in a big company. I hate to say it. And then it's like, you know what? This is not the place for me. So I just left after four years at Exxon in Denver and started my own company and uh, been kind of doing things ever since along those lines. And I'll tell you, I come to work every day and I stare at that wall and I say, now, how am I going to make money today? Right. And what I will tell you is, and I'll probably make a few enemies along the way, but most of our training in big companies, they don't want you to think. It's like you come to work and you're told you will make three structure maps, you'll make two isopacks, you'll get them ready by Thursday. And don't worry about anything else. Don't worry about money. We're gonna, we got the economics person. Don't worry about drilling the well. We got the engineers, et cetera. So that is a dichotomy. You know, we go into these environments out of college that actually discourage thinking. And again, I'm not trying to be rude, but I'm just saying beyond your specialty, you know, stay in your box. You know, when the geophysicist speaks, you let them speak. And by God, the petrophysicist had better not speak. 
because it's the geophysicist speaking. And when the engineer speaks, everybody else shut up. So anyway, so we, we have some things inherent in our system that discourage some of these things we're talking about, adapting, changing, thinking, uh, figuring out new ways to make money. So anyway, again, kind of rambling, but maybe spur discussion from some of the other silent people in the background. Yeah, Tom, would you like to say, I love your points in the chat. Would you like to say something? Probably not. <laughs> well, well, I'll, uh, oh, go ahead, I guess, Tom. thank you. Uh, Sorry. I didn't mean to lob things in there. I think uh, the uh, discussion here has been great, but you know, the Alan pointed out and, uh, and Mike as well, you know, there's a lot of uh, bomb throwers out there, literally, and we need to, we need to, you know, let them bounce off us, know that some are going to explode close and uh, figure out how we deal with them. You know, I find it really tough that uh, the 30 or 40 years I've done, you know, uh, doing my best to make it, it, it make America independent with energy you know, gets uh, dissed and, and, you know, tossed to the wayside. And those are tough things to deal with. Uh, we've got to be resilient. I think this, uh, this session has been great in uh, showing resources that are out there and that we're not alone. That's, uh, that's an important realization, I believe. Yeah, I'll just piggyback off of that. Of <laughs> that, that has kind of been one saving grace, in my opinion, is we're all, everybody is dealing with some kind of uh, uh, change like this. So we're all just trying to figure it out right now and the best ways to move forward. And um, I'll say, you know, um, we'll be, I'll be, uh, after, after the program, we'll be sending out um, uh, our common, the storm program, the uh, dot com. Uh, there, we, uh, we have an assessment of, you know, like a stress assessment that you can pre-take. And what's great about this program that I, I'm particularly fond of is it really starts with in yourself. And then as you move through kind of the modules of, you know, how do you clear your own brain first? Because you can't collaborate and make really important decisions if your mind is really bogged down with a lot of negative thinking and, uh, you know, all just a lot of stress. And so, you know, step one, how do you clear your own mind? And then how do you change your way of thinking? And then how do you uh, interact with others? How do you make decisions with big groups of people who are, you know, polarized? Um, and uh, so I think, what's great about it, it, what's great about kind of this, uh, you know, personal development of yourself and working with others and how to move forward in this positive direction is, you know, there's a lot that you, you could be doing, but we can't do it all at once. Uh, I know there just really seems to be, you know, it's like a sense of urgency, right? It's like, we, you know, we have to make all the decisions now, but you kind of have to just take a step back and, um, you know, take a deep breath, and how can we as a group, you know, with lots of differing opinions, uh, different information, how do we collect all of this and move forward together and make the best possible decisions for us, for our communities, and, you know, for the industry in general? So, um, you know, I, I think, you know, it's just like you have to just like you said, uh, you know, learning one thing a week or, uh, you know, just put, I have to watch a documentary a week just because that fills my cup and I like to learn something new every week. So I, I set aside an app, like a couple hours on Sunday, uh, get with my coffee and I want to learn something new rather, you know, it could be fun. It could be business oriented. I use LinkedIn learning a lot. Um, and, uh, so there's just so many different tools out there, um, like Lorraine and her, her tools are, you know, fantastic. Uh, there's all kinds of, you know, free apps and everything that can really help you kind of start making those, um, you know, little changes, but then you take a look back, you know, a year from now, man, I, you know, 
I'm now the best version of myself because of all these, like one thing I did maybe once a month, maybe it's just two things, but those are two more things in your tool belt that you can bring to the table. I just like to speak really briefly about um, the, the, the hits. I know you guys are taking, you, you folks are taking. Um, and I, I did feel it, as I mentioned, when I tried to de defend the FBI's spokesperson for, you know, in Northern California. But the other thing that really um, allowed me to do this was I believed in the mission. Um, I believed in what the FBI is doing. And I'm sure you guys all believe in what you're doing. Um, I, I almost was washed out of the academy. I came very, very close. Um, and it was because I couldn't do push-ups. I mean, you know, uh, you had to push out, you had to, you know, 50 push-ups that counted. And I couldn't, I didn't do it. And I did come very close to being washed out. And I had to really dig deep into understanding why I was there to begin with. I mean, was this just a bunch of sadists I surrounded myself with? It felt like it sometimes. But um, it, when, I, when I got into the Bureau, what I realized was that internally, FBI stands for fidelity, bravery, and integrity. Now, we're talking values. And those values, growing up on a cattle ranch in Wyoming, Tom, you said you grew up in, in Montana, and I, uh, and, and I know Mike grew up in uh, North Dakota. But it, uh, those values meant something to me because I, I, those were values I could get behind. I mean, I, you know, in that part of the country, you, you, you learn the, the value of being um, faithful, being uh, brave, being, uh, having that integrity to get the job done. That's what got me through. And if I couldn't have tied what I was doing to my values, uh, I don't think I would have finished with the FBI, to, to be really honest. Um, I had to find something beyond just the paycheck, something beyond just whatever. I needed to find something that would give me, give my life value and meaning. It wasn't just a job. If, because if it is just a job, then when you hit tough times or you, you know, whatever is assaulting you, um, from, whether it's internally or externally forced upon you, um, it's much harder to to keep going. You you question. I I never questioned any of the question the the criticisms that the ACLU or that the reporters. I mean, they just wanted to. The, the reporters were not our friend either. They just wanted to catch us at something that was you know we did wrong. And so if I could, didn't have the faith and the belief in my values and what FBI was trying to do, I couldn't persuade anybody. I mean, you know, even the ACLU even gave me a pass because I mean, I spoke from my heart, you know? No, we're not perfect as, a, as an organization, but we are working, we are good, really good. So I, I just wanna throw that in there too when you're dealing with all this criticism to remember that and remember where your values are and why you're doing this to begin with. If I could just uh, say one more thing before uh, we wrap it up, I guess I don't know. I think I think we wrap it up at uh, an hour. Um, one of the last questions that I have that I'd like to just kind of leave everyone with that I find a little frustrating, and it might it might bother some geologists to hear it or geo whatever people that work with the extractive resources. And that's that, you know, at a, you know, during this transition or paradigm shift from one source of energy to another, I might be speaking out of turn and saying this, but you know, the the amount of materials that are necessary and what we need to actually make this function is to some unobtainable and at a very minimum questionable. And yet we are engaged and asked to shift from a technology that we know currently functions to a technology and a method of generating electricity that we know, deep down we know there isn't enough, say, cobalt or the materials that are required for, you know, we're, 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 we're moving away from something that's deemed evil into something that's questionable as far as you know the weights gains 
you know, cost benefit, you know, the, the solar plants, let's say, taking up a bigger footprint than the oil derrick or the solar panels manufactured in China and camps or the state of Africa being treated like a chessboard between feuding countries for resources, where in the United States, we probably have the most robust, the most comprehensive set of rules and regulations that allow us to, if, if indeed we are, our goal is to save the planet, the best possible place, and I know we live in an echo chamber. So geologists, we've all talked about it. We've all heard it. The best place to do it would be the United States, not in Africa where you have children digging with their hands looking for cobalt for other countries. And, you know, that's that's something that's a contradiction. You know, we're saving the planet. We're helping to shift away from the dirty uh, petrol resources. And we're doing it on the backs of third world and second world countries in the name of, you know, uh, I guess saving ourselves. It's 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 a it's a contradiction that I grapple with. So you know, transitioning to a different field or a different science within the power generation is a little problematic because you're not going to do it really here, if that makes any sense. Uh, I don't know if there's a question there or not, but that's something that I think about. And Alan, you you have a your hand up. You're muted. Sorry, click there the wrong button. Yeah. So no, I just wanted to get one other idea out before the the time's up, and this will be to save Susan another seminar here. So uh, you know, another big thing. There's lots of negative stuff about is um, for those of us who have many decades of experience, right? So. We're too old, et cetera, et cetera. So Mike, you're still young, Susan's still young, but people like me, you know, uh, there's a lot of, like, let's get rid of them, let's get out of the way. And I will just tell you that one of the wonderful things about geoscience is for better or for worse, it's one of those fields that the more basins you have worked, the more areas you have worked, you only improve. So if you've done it 30 years, you have to be better than you were 10, 10 years. And so like a good wine, we only improve with time. Now. Again, those companies don't want to hire us. They don't want to hire someone my age or whatever, but I have to believe that at some point when they get serious again about, well, could be CCUS or back to natural gas, they will need those skills. At least that's what I tell myself when I come in the office every morning, that uh, someone's going to need the skills uh, of those of us who have been around for quite a few decades. So anyway, but uh, there you go, Susan. We can address that topic so you can save it. You don't have to do another separate seminar. I love it. And, and oh, really good points in the chat, too. Well, I want to thank everyone. I think it looks like we are up against the end of our, our time. Okay. Uh, did you want to say any, any last minute uh, um, comments, Tom? Or? It's crazy. Oh, well. <laughs> Eric is unmuted, and I don't think he knows. Oh, okay. Well, let me see if we can. Well, we're about to wrap up and see if we can find Eric. At any rate, I want to thank everybody for being here and, and also especially Mike for okay. some really profound questions that have have okay. kind of reached a, the, the yes. heart of, of some of our existential issues right now. And if you'd like to to say a few final words and maybe a final wrap up word from Maureen and one from, from and some from Lorray and the mic, we'll um, we're recording this. We'll make it available. You get an email, and I'll have the link to the recording, and all is good. Um, it was a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Susan, for inviting me. Um, I love what these this group is doing. Um, and I would just encourage people to uh, take my mental toughness assessment. Again, it's free and there's no, uh, it, it's just available. It's a tool to help you understand maybe where your strengths are or those areas where you could, um, you know, use some improvement. And um, there is the Secrets of a Strong Mind, the book, 
and of course the online training program as well. I'd love to see you there. So, but thank you for inviting me into this group. Thank you. And Susan, Mike, thank you so much. This has been such a fascinating conversation and I, thank you so much for letting me be a part of it. And uh, I encourage every, uh, everyone, uh, 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 if you go to commonthestormprogram.com, um, you can take your mental toughness with Loray and then we've got our you know, stress management, how you manage stress and change um, and how you can work well with others. So if you go to commonthestormprogram.com, you can take uh, an assessment. We give you some, some tips and it's all free. So um, those are some great resources for you as well. So just a lot of great information coming out of this program. So thank you so much. Well, Mike, you want to say some final words? Sure. Uh, yeah, these aren't uh, easily answered questions, and these aren't easily tackled uh, problems. And unfortunately, will just develop through time. And so I appreciate the fact that Susan reached out and asked uh, for me to pose some questions today. They're questions that we'll, I'll probably still have tomorrow, um, but we just have to kind of wait and see. And hopefully, as as a geoscience community, we can become more engaged, I hate to say it, but more engaged semi-politically to bring awareness somehow, I don't know, uh, to people on exactly how and where these things are, are created. And through that, maybe make more informed decisions that actually are going to be beneficial for the world as a whole. So thank you. And thanks to Lorraine and Maureen and Susan. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. And on the behalf of um, Energy Minerals Division, and also a big plug to our joint uh, event image, our joint with um, SEG, we're all geoscientists here. And, and thank you. And thank you for, for those in the audience who participated with, uh, with, with brave questions and comments. Thanks, Alan and Tom. And we'll see you later. Thanks again. Thank you.